so first, you know, this is a wonderful opportunity and I, and I really thank you all of you for coming. Uh, my name is Antonio Giralde. I'm originally from Spain. I'm currently a, a professor of genetics at Yale University um, and also the chair of the department of genetics. Um, and, um, and in my laboratory, we uh, basically study how animals develop um, and, and how the genes control the development of animals. And I, uh, originally, I studied chemistry and I loved to do experiments since I was about your age. And I drove my parents crazy and I was a little bit of a pyromaniac, which means that I would just love to, to set things on fire and make explosions. And, and, and I just got into science and, and doing experiments and, and initially, uh, got really fell in love with chemistry and, and, and had like a little chemistry lab with uh, all kinds of things that my father used to bring from his job. And, and that then evolved into the, what I like to call the chemistry of life and, and how the genes influence the making of an embryo. Okay, so one of the kids, they uh, had a message and they wanted to know who did you look up to growing up? What did I look up? So I look, uh, for me, the, the, I looked at to my teachers, you know, they were really an awesome inspiration. And, um, and I love when they let me, you know, get in the lab after hours and, 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 and just play in the laboratory and do experiments. You know, I remember when um, I, I built a good relationship with some of my teachers and they they trust me more than they should and they let me just sneak into the laboratory and so I remember doing experiments um, and, and so that was great. I, I think um, for me what was important is that they I was very curious and they um, what, what really was very helpful for me is that they foster my my curiosity, you know, so there was, I remember there was a teacher that, um, Don Manuel, that basically was giving me points for doing, for bringing experiments. And, and I would just do all kinds of, of crazy exp experiments, some of which make no sense now in retrospect, but I just love, I just love doing that. So for me, that was a big um, source of inspiration. I, um, I, early on, I got into into um, like reading books in about the universe. So I, I had really a great admiration from Stephen Hawking, and you know the Big Bang theory. That was something that was you know when I was about um, uh, when I was about in eighth grade, which is equivalent of you know I think it's the equivalent of eighth grade. It's about. 13 years old, uh, I was really interested about that. And I, I remember asking my teachers about the theory of relativity. I still don't, don't quite understand it. And I was very curious about those things. So, so I think the teachers had a great impact on, on, on helping me foster my creativity, although they didn't answer all my questions. <laughs> How do you investigate codes that shape gene expression during embryonic development? So how do we investigate gene expression in embryonic development? So, um, so what we uh, typically, so I work with a, with a, a vertebrate animal, which is uh, a, a zebrafish embryo. So zebrafish you can get in the pet stores. They are like, um, like you know, small uh, fish that come from India. And, and the way we investigate gene expression is we, the, the eggs are fertilized in the morning and you know we put a male and a female and we get eggs in the morning we put them underneath the microscope and we are able to inject them and uh and so we basically inject different genes and we see what happens to other genes so basically if you put a gene that is able to activate other genes um uh, we will see those genes increase in the levels uh and 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 if we put something that reduces or represses the expression of other genes, we will see those genes uh, reduce. And then we look what happens to the development of the embryo. So it's, it's really quite amazing because you feel 
uh, I mean, this is a little bit of a, of a, of a demigod answer and egocentric, but you feel a little bit like you're playing with life. You are, you're acting like a little bit like a mini god uh, and are able to, to really modify how an embryo is made. And, and I just love that to be able to change how genes are expressed or making mutants. The other way we make mutants is there are some, you might have heard about it, something called Cas9, the Nobel Prize for, um, for I think a couple of years ago was the person that discovered this. They are like little molecular scissors that are able to cut the DNA. And, and we put them like a, um, it's almost like a, like a target that is able to bring these scissors to different parts of the genome. So you have studied DNA and you know that the DNA is two strands that are complementary to one another. So basically you can take a sequence of, in this case is RNA and target those scissors to different parts and make mutations. And you know, 24 hours later, we can see how those mutations in the fish have changed their shape. So it's quite amazing. So it's, it's, I usually use the example of imagine that you are an extraterrestrial individual that have never seen a car and you encounter a car for the first time and you say, how, how does, you know, what is the function of steering wheel? So you basically remove the steering wheel. That's what genetics does. You remove the steering wheel and then you see what happens to the car. You remove the wheels. So that allows you to create hypotheses and understand what the function of genes are. That's, that's super interesting. And uh, one of the kids, one of the kids wanted to know what are what are some of the um, the genetic disorders uh, that that you've been uh, working on. So we have studied different genetic disorders. So one um, disorder um, we have uh, studied is autism. So when I was uh, 15 years ago, I started my laboratory here at Yale, and um, and a, a professor that was studying autism in humans by trying to identify the genes um, got me really excited. I had just become a father and I, you know, and some of the phenotypes, uh, the representation of autism really touched me. Uh, um, and so I became interested and we started to make mutations with these molecular scissors that I was explaining before. Uh, make mutations in the same genes that are causing autism in humans to try to see what the phenotypes are in a fish with the idea of, you know, of course, you don't expect the same phenotypes in a fish than in a human, but, um, but maybe the same, you know, it's like the example that I was using of the car, you know, you know, the steering wheel of a, of a, of a Dodge caravan is, not the same maybe that steering wheel of, of a Mercedes-Benz or a BMW, um, but you know, if you learn how one of them works, you can learn how the other works. So that's kind of what we are trying, uh, what we are trying to do. Another, another set of disorders that we study are um, um, microcephaly, you know, when you have defects in brain development and you have a very small brain. So we are trying to st study um, uh, from human mutations that show these, these, uh, these phenotypes, we are trying to study what happens if we mutate those genes to understand what are the genes that are regulated by, by that particular gene that is mutated in humans. Now, if you work with uh, genetic disorders or genetic testing, so myself, I work more with uh, genetic disorders, trying to understand kind of the basic function of, uh, of the genes and how they make an embryo. But um, because I am part of a department that, that also has a clinical branch that studies um, human genetics, we also, I'm, I'm very involved in, in genetic testing. So one example, um, of a project that we have recently developed uh, with some colleagues here uh, is, um, is called a generations project. And it's trying to understand basically sequencing the genome um, of people that you know, come to the hospital or just people like you and me and trying to understand from their genes and predict whether they are gonna have higher 
probability to get a particular disease. So I, I volunteer and, and actually, you know, I found some interesting things about me that, that allow me to be proactive about uh, my health. And so, so this is becoming more and more common. And, and I think it's really, it's almost a little bit like the power of predicting the future with some statistical number. It's a, it's a probability. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really exciting. You know, if you think about it, cancer, you know, kills in many cases because it's not detected early enough. So if we, if we are able to understand a particular predisposition, for example, for cancer or, or for other diseases, um, I think it would be very helpful in, in helping, you know, uh, disease prevention and, and, and human health. Um, first of all, you kind of like hinted at my question already, but I just wanted to see, looking at how far we've come in genetic research, what are your hopes for the future? Like, do you feel positive that we'll be discovering more about genetic diseases? What is your like hopes, you know? Ciao, Cristina. Grazie mille. So I, I think that there are, um, I think the hope for genetics is, is amazing. You know, we are. You know, if you if you consider the field of genetics as a human being, we are kind of in the in the toddler phase, I would say. So so there is a lot of room um, uh, for progress. Um, we you know there are I think there are seven thousand rare diseases, um, uh, uh, and and many of them we still don't know what the gene that is uh, mutated uh, uh, in, in, in many other cases, you know, for, for common disease like cardiovascular disease, um, uh, for other phenotypes like obesity uh, that also have an impact on health. Um, even on the way we process our food, you know, like, I mean, you have friends that maybe eat the same of you and they grow in different ways, you know? So we still don't understand. Just imagine the genome, you know, if the genome had, um, you know, we only know about the function of one to 5% of the genome. We have sequence, you know, it's like, we know all the letters of the book of the genome, but we only understand about between one and 5% of the words on that book. So just imagine how much there is still to learn because the problem is that, we, you know, imagine the book is the genome and we sequence the genome of different people and we find changes in the letters. But many of those changes are happening in the 95% that we don't understand. And we know that it must have a role in, in disease, must have a role in how each of us looks different from one another. Um, but so to understand what a change in the genome means, we really need to understand the function of almost every nucleotide, uh, every base in the genome. So I think there is still a lot of progress. Some of my hopes is that as we gain um, more knowledge of that, that we are able to you know, sequence everybody and that we will be able to predict, you know, you have to be careful with this kind of foods, or with this environment, because this, you know, if you have these types of food or this environment, it will have a stronger impact on your health. So I think uh, using reading the genome to then predict what could happen to you. Um, uh, I mean, there are, the, this movie might not be appropriate for your age, which might, might uh, uh, attract your attention, but there is a movie called Gataka. Um, that, that you know talks about you know everybody's sequence and talks about the dangers of, of that. I think we also the other flip side of your question, Christina, is that um, you know it comes with great responsibility to to learn about the genome of people. You know from from how insurances will will deal with that information uh, to. Uh, you know, to will you discriminate people that have one type of genome versus another type of genome? So I think that is that is another that's the dangerous side of 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 genetics. What obstacles have you encountered, and how did you overcome 
what obstacles? So I have, I mean, I think, what obstacles? I think, um, I think some of the obstacles that I have uh, encounter, um, you know, like uh, are obstacles that maybe some of, of you guys students find, you know, like sometimes you have to, throughout your career, you have to do things that you like and things that you don't like as much, you know. Uh, and you know that those things that you don't like as much are important, they, you know. So I think uh, some of the obstacles uh, uh, have been to really be able to hunker down and kind of, you know, plow through some of the things that you don't like so that you can get to other things that you like. Those things that you don't like change with your career, you know, and change, you know, from from year to year in your school. Um, uh, but but I think that um, it, it's it's a, it's a something that is important. Like in my stage is more like how do I deal with some bureaucratic aspects. Uh, in in my career, I think some of the obstacles have been also great opportunities. For example, I left Spain pretty early on when I was, uh, it might look like I was old for many of you, but I was, you know, like 22 years old, I, I moved to Germany. I didn't speak any German, uh, but I, I wanted to do my, my PhD on, on a special place uh, that did molecular biology. So, you know, there I faced a lot of challenges of speaking, not speaking the language and, and being in a community that was quite far from my family. Um, I think sometimes um, I feel uh, you can be judged on the way, you know, when I moved to the United States uh, to do my postdoc, which is basically after you do your PhD and do some research, you kind of keep going and do some more research before you become a professor. Um, sometimes um, being an immigrant and, and not having a perfect accent, as you can recognize, uh, sometimes can give the wrong impression to people because, you know, I, even though I speak three languages, you know, Italian, Spanish, and, and English, uh, some people might think, well, this person is not very eloquent in English, and they confuse that with other aspects of your intellect, you know, so that might have been one of the challenges uh, that you can face. And you just have to, you know, do what you love. In my case, I just love doing science and, and, and kind of shed off some of those criticisms, you know, because at the end, people hopefully will, will realize of your potential. So I think, but, you know, to your question, um, Ms. Delgado, I think for me, what is important is just to do what I love and, you know, and, and the challenges will, will sometimes go away. Uh, uh, or it will be easier to bear, you know, and, and I, for, in my case, I just love doing science and do, and, uh, you know, mentoring students and postdocs and, and, and do experiments, you know, so that's, it's, it's always easier when you're doing what you love. Well, we can't thank you enough for connecting with us. And uh, before we let you go, is there any advice that you could give to these kids as they go off in the world and discover what they want to do, whether it's working in your field or completely different. You're very accomplished. You have many awards, many recognitions. What advice would you give them? You know, my advice is, um, is think about what you would like to do, what you would love to do, um, and just follow your passion. I think that's, you know, that's the, the best way to be happy, I think. <laughs>